appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for your kindness toward me. And uh, to move right along with the shortness of the hour, let's get right to the word of the Lord. Found in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. Amen. If you could do just a little bit more, it wouldn't hurt my feelings with those monitors. Luke chapter 15, it's going to seem like I'm going to read the whole chapter, but I promise I'm not going to. We're going to start at verse 3, and the scripture says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Before I read, Brother Height, that was fabulous. That was tremendous. That it was very, very moving. And I, I cannot sit and see lost souls getting saved and changed lives without tears filling my eyes. I was very moved by that. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? And go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it upon his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me. That's what we did with Brother Hyde today. Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, everyone say ten pieces of silver. If she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. And he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now look very closely. And not many days after, the younger son gathered together, took his journey to a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. There was a period of time between receiving his inheritance and then later leaving. He did not leave immediately. I would like to preach for just a little bit, recognizing our time is short, that uh, just the lost coins, the lost coins. Father, we love you. You have been here in such a beautiful way, and we appreciate your presence and your leading and your anointing. Our hearts are made glad by the reaping of the harvest we're touched and burdened to do our part in the kingdom father there's precious people here that want to be reapers of the harvest thank you for your continued anointing and blessing upon us in the name of jesus we pray and everybody said amen god bless you you may be seated And so I would like to propose to you today that this 15th chapter of Luke, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, is not three separate parables, but one continuous parable depicting a progression I would like to submit that the sheep, the lost sheep that was found became one of the coins because he spake this parable unto them. 
And the lost coin became the lost son. Amen. First off, let me ask you how many are glad, really glad, that you're a child of God today? I am so glad. Brother Mangan preached about the shoots and the olive tree. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's been many a day that I've been a jealous Christian because I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal church. I was 21 years old before I ever heard about this. I was lost and seeking and looking for an answer. And thank God a Pentecostal preacher knocked on my door. And I had been praying in my own strange way for direction in my life. And the Lord had spoken to me in that fall of 1971. I told him I wanted to move to Arizona. That was a cool place to go. And he spoke to me and said, don't do that. I have something new for you in the new year. And so we canceled our plans to move. And during the holiday of between Christmas and New Year's, Brother Wright came and knocked on our door. And he was a weird-looking dude. He had a tie on, and he had short hair. And uh, that was pretty weird to me. But he had a glow on his face and an anointing in his life. And when he began to talk to my wife and I, about Pentecost, receiving the Holy Ghost, being baptized. We looked at each other and recognized that this is what the Lord had for us in the new year. We went to his church a couple nights later and received the Holy Ghost at first service and uh, was baptized in Jesus' name. And I'm glad uh, I'm a child of God tonight. So I didn't have, I wasn't a shoot except as a shoot from the pastor. But now I have some children, and I have a son who's graduating from TBC next week, and a daughter who's in college in Washington. She started a Christian fellowship at her school. So I've got some shoots going, praise the Lord, and we'll get something rolling here. And so there's been many a time that I was jealous, I guess, or disappointed that I wasn't raised in a Pentecostal home. But then there's been some other times that in some ways I was glad as I grew up and became uh, exposed to things because I've seen a lot of Pentecostal people that just flat don't appreciate what they've got. They were raised on pews and heard all kind of great preaching and somehow had become desensitized to how good they've got it and how great God is. I don't want to lose my ability to magnify and praise the name of the Lord. I pity Pentecostals that have been around so long that they can no longer get excited about the goodness of God. They can't praise the Lord. They can't get excited. They can't get with the program, and I pity them. I'm glad that I'm feeling what I'm feeling in this room today. I don't ever want to come to the house of God and sit there like a bump on a log. When the Spirit of the Lord begins to move, I don't want to be looking around. I want to be looking up. Can you say amen? I was this lost sheep that Jesus talked about, whom he left the ninety and nine and came found this one lost sheep. And he brought him in rejoicing. I came in rejoicing. How many came in rejoicing? Praise the Lord. I never saw anybody get the Holy Ghost feeling sorry for themselves. I never saw anybody get the Holy Ghost having a pity party. And the scripture says to rejoice evermore. The prefix re means to do it again. Rejoice means to do your joy again. I think that's one advantage, as you pointed out, Brother Height. He that's forgiven of much, loveth much. I think that might be one advantage of having not been raised in a Pentecostal church because you realize where you came from. You realize what you've been brought out of. 
You realize what you've been put into. You realize where you were going. And you realize where you're going to. And if you don't forget that, it's not hard to rejoice ever more. It's not hard to do the joy again. Same thing that brought the joy the first time will bring the joy again and again. Lifting him up, praising him, glorifying him. If you love Jesus, give him a clap and praise offering right now, would you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. Oh, some men trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord. And so that lost sheep represents that lost person that Brother Hyde put on so effectively the screen. Oh, not all of them have it all together yet, but they're going to get it together. I see the smiles on their faces, the, the shine in their eyes. It makes me want to run home and go find somebody lost communicate the love of God to them to see those kind of faces to be brought out of darkness and to be so thrilled about it to be so excited about it oh, I want tomorrow when I'm preaching I want somebody to get the Holy Ghost tomorrow so bad I want to see lost sheep come in amen how about you that's why you're here he brought him upon his shoulders with rejoicing and then he commanded everybody to rejoice with him. It would seem odd that he'd have to ask his friends and neighbors to rejoice. But nevertheless, he did. I can't understand when there's people getting the Holy Ghost at the altar. When there's Pentecostals talking in the foyer. I feel like when the sheep is coming in, everybody ought to rejoice about it. That's why you're in here, because you got a burden to see sheep come into the fold. Amen. The most important people in that church service or in that Sunday school class, the way I see it, are the ones that haven't yet come into the fold. He left the 90 and 9 and went and found that one lost sheep. Oh, somehow I need a fresh burden to reach out and touch that lost sheep and bring him in with rejoicing. I want my church to rejoice when somebody gets saved. I don't want them in the foyer. I want them working around the altar. I don't want them passing notes. I want them praying for the sinners. How about somebody just saying amen? amen. Somebody's got to care or it isn't going to happen. And so that lost sheep, came into the fold, and there was rejoicing. In heaven, there's rejoicing over sinners. And he said that we should rejoice with him. And then I would submit to you today that this lost sheep then becomes one of those coins. That the story continues to unfold, not a separate parable, but a continuance of the parable that the lost sheep became one of the coins. Now the sheep is in the house. Now the sheep is in the fold. One of the precious coins that is in the house. And so the Bible says that this woman had ten pieces of silver and she lost one piece. And what does she do when she loses that piece? The Bible says that she lit a candle and she swept the house and she sought diligently until she found it. She was not nonchalant about her search for the coin. This sheep had become a coin and one of these coins somehow had slipped out of her hand and had rolled somewhere in the house, similar to that coin right there. The coin was in the house, but the Bible says she lost it. So it was a lost coin in the house, but lost in the house. It was lost, 
but it was still in the house. In other words, it was in the house, but it was lost in the house. The Bible says she lost it. It was no longer in the hand of her possession. No longer was it in the hand of her care. But it had somehow slipped out of her hand and it rolled up under somewhere and was in the house and lost in the house. If there was anything that would concern me right now this morning and as a pastor, not only am I concerned about the sheep, but I'm also concerned about some coins in the house that used to be in the hand of power and anointing but somehow lost the joy of their salvation and have no longer under the hand of power and glory but have just slipped down under a pew somewhere and are in the house and lost in the house. You know what I'm talking about. People that come to church but there's no move in their heart. People that come to the house but don't get in the hand of glory and anointing. When God filled me with the Holy Ghost, that just wasn't a one-time experience to feel Him and to touch Him. But I want to stay not only in the house, but I also want to stay in His hand of power and glory. There are people sitting in our churches that are in the house but I wonder if they haven't really become like this lost coin in the house, but lost in the house. People that won't pray, people that won't praise, people that won't get blessed. How many know what I'm talking about? Is it possible to get confused between being in the house and in the hand? Just getting into a building does not put you into his presence. You've got to do more and I've got to do more than just get my carcass in a building. But once I get in the building, I need to make sure I get myself in the hand of the presence and the glory of God. There is a spirit in our day, if you please. Maybe it's just up in Washington, D.C. But there is a spirit that wants to suppress the saints and the ministry and just wear us out and wear us down down and cause us to be blasé, cause us to be nonchalant and just, you know, take it as it comes. If God moves, fine. If he doesn't move, that's okay too. But ladies and gentlemen, that's a great way to be in the house, but lost in the house. I want to do more than just get to the building. I want to press my way into the presence of God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. I want to feel what I felt when I got the Holy Ghost. I want to shout like I shouted when I first got saved. I don't want to be in the house but not in the hand of anointing and power. So I say to you today, devil, you better look out because I'm not satisfied to be in a closet or up underneath somewhere. I I want to get myself in the hand of anointing and the hand of glory and I want every saint of God to be there also oh God we cannot afford to dry up on the pew lose our victory lose our joy lose our anointing lose our burden because he is here as brother Blackburn sang this morning he is here oh hallelujah he is here amen and if he's here I'm going to praise the Lord I'm going to magnify God, I want to get in the hand of power and blessing. You know what a raisin is? A raisin is a dried up grape. You know what a prune is, a moving experience? It's a dried up plum. You ever met old sister prune face? We got too many raisins. And too many prunes sitting on our pews that used to have life 
that used to have juice, that used to be fresh, that have somehow got severed from the vine and severed from the tree and the heat of life has shriveled them up. Oh, but here's the good part. If you just get back in the hand of glory and power, he'll breathe fresh life into your spirit. Would you lift your hands and magnify God with a loud voice with me right now? In the name of Jesus. Praise God. And so here comes our part. Sitting in our classrooms, sitting in our sanctuaries, our lost coins. I've got them, you got them. They used to have anointing. Now they're just sitting there. They used to have a burden. Now they're just sitting there. And so what did she do? To her discredit, she had perhaps become a little careless. And that coin had gotten away from her. But to her credit, she became greatly agitated and concerned about the loss of the coin. And so she lit a candle. And she got a broom and she began to sweep and to search until she found it. That's often what pastoring is all about. Lighting up a candle of the word. Reaching out with the conviction of the spirit. Sweeping the house. Trying to re-save the saved. Saving the saved. How are we ever going to save the lost if we have to keep saving the saved? Saving to save. Get them to pray like they know they should pray. Trying to get Am I making any sense to anybody here today? Trying to get them to worship like they ought to know how to do without being told. Sweeping them up. Getting them back in the hand. Dear Lord, what if God just told every preacher just to preach evangelistic messages to the lost for six months so he could reap a harvest saving the lost? What would the save do? The saved have already heard enough preaching about how to pray through. The saved have already known how to get a hold of God. What if God just trusted the saved to keep themselves saved so that God could go win some lost sheep? Amen. And so when the preacher is preaching, he's sweeping the house. The teacher needs to sweep the house, light the candle, and seek diligently till she found it. This coin was in the house, but lost in the house. Isn't that like how the foolish virgins were? They were in the house, but they were lost in the house. They were proud of their virginity, but their lamps and their their vessels were empty of anointing oil. There was no oil in their vessels, and there was no oil in their lamps, So they were in the house, but they were lost in the house. And when the bridegroom came, how many's hearing what I'm saying here today? When the bridegroom came, they were not ready. And they had to try to get it together at the last minute and get prayed through and get back in the hand. But it was too late to do it. The time to pray through is not when the trumpet is sounding. The time to pray through is when the candle is lit and the broom is sweeping and God is calling. Oh, God, help us stay in the hand. Let's not be around this so long that we can't shout anymore. We can't worship anymore. We can't be moved anymore. Oh, thank God for those slides I saw today. But not only that, thank God that I can still be moved by the sight of a lost sheep coming in. That lets me know I still have what I need to have. I don't want to be in the house But lost in the house, I want to be in the hand. Isn't that what Judas was like? He was in the house, but he was lost in the house. He was in his uh, presence, but he was out of his reach. He could not be reached. He was in the presence of the Lord, but the Lord couldn't reach him. I think I've got some people like that in my church. They're not wicked people. They're not awful people. They come to the house. 
house, but they, he can't seem to reach them. They won't pray anymore. They won't get a burden anymore. They won't come on visitation anymore. They won't teach Bible studies anymore. You couldn't give them a Sunday school classroom because somehow they slipped from the hand of anointing and became lost in the house. Let me further make my point that this lost coin became the lost son. For when the younger son said to his father, and I'm trying to hasten here, said to his father, give that which falleth to me, the portion of goods that falleth to me. He was not rightfully due his inheritance until his father had died. You're not rightfully due your inheritance until the father is dead. And what he said to his father was another word saying, as far as I'm concerned, you've already died. And I want that which comes to me after you're dead. I would submit to you that there was no more fellowship between the son and his father. But he did not leave his father's house immediately. He was in the house, but he was lost in the house. For the scripture says after he was divided, the living was divided to him. It was not many days after that the younger son gathered together and left. There was a space of time between when fellowship had died and he finally left the house. You know, when Sister Sally backslid last week and didn't come back to church, she didn't backslide last week. She backslid a long time before that. There was a period of time where she was in the house, but there was no fellowship anymore. But while she was there and there was no fellowship, somebody had lit a candle Somebody had been sweeping the house, but somehow she just crawled, Daddy, is that what you say down here? And backed herself in a corner and wouldn't let herself be moved and wouldn't repent. And after a few days, she finally left the house. When God is reaching for you to pray through to a new level or a new dimension, that's not the time to hide in the closet. That's the time to let the broom sweep you up into his presence and into the hand of anointing and power. I don't want to be lost in the house. You and I have a commission as teachers and preachers to light that candle in those classrooms and to sweep with the sweeping of prayer, burden, intercession, and teaching, and bring them back into the hand. Would you just praise the Lord with me for just a few moments? Praise God. Would you praise him with a loud voice, please? Oh, if you want to get a fresh anointing in this Sunday school conference. If you want to get a fresh anointing in this conference, let him sweep you up. Let the light shine in the name of Jesus. Maybe I could just pause right here. stir anybody if you're not stirred. Nobody's going to praise him if you don't praise him. Nobody's going to move if you haven't moved. You're not going to affect anybody if you haven't been affected. If you become one of those coins, you're not going to be effective in the kingdom of God. I don't want to lose the anointing I got when I got saved. Let me just ask you this question. If you want a fresh anointing as a Christian, if you want a fresh anointing as a teacher or preacher, if you desire it in your heart, I don't mean, you know, oh, well, I guess I got to. I don't mean that. But if there's something inside that's tired of being pushed down, if there's something inside that's tired of being quenched, 
and you want to break through and break out. You remember when David said, thank you for the extra 15. When David said, oh, I want to drink of the wells of Bethlehem. I want to drink from some water that I drank from when I was a kid. I want to drink from some water that I drank through when I was a new convert. In order to get that water, there had to be a breakthrough. The somebody had to break through the Philistines. Let me tell you the problem with a lot of lost coins in our churches. They're just too lazy to break through the flesh barrier and get themselves a fresh touch from God. You can't get a fresh touch being too lazy to pay the price of prayer and pay the price of praise. There has to be a breakthrough. I feel like God wants to help somebody break through today. I want to be in the hand. Does that make sense? Am I making any sense? Somebody's got to say, I'm tired of being where I am. I've got to get deeper. I've got to get farther. I need a fresh touch. If you want a fresh touch, lift your hands and begin to talk in tongues. God, pour out fresh oil. Pour out fresh oil. Reach over and pray for somebody. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder and pray one for another right now, please. Pray one for another. Pray one for another. He caught out of the, There has to be a breaking through. Those three men broke through the Philistines. You can't touch somebody if you haven't been touched. You can't move somebody if you haven't been moved. Oh, come on, reach around and pray for somebody. Pray for somebody else. You don't have to know them. You just got to care about them. And while you're blessing them, you'll get blessed. Reach around and pray for somebody else. I don't want to be just in the house. I want to be in the hands. I need a breaking through. I need a breaking through. I need a breaking through. I feel some sweeping. I see the light. I feel the bristles of the broom. Oh, give me that old time religion. I want to drink from the pools like I used to drink. I want something from Bethlehem. I want to shout like I used to shout it. I want to pray like I used to pray. I want to worship like I used to worship. I want to be a soul winner like I used to be a soul winner. Oh, take me back to the pools of Bethlehem. But there's got to be a breaking through. Ataya, I feel the broom. Anybody feel the broom? Come on, coins. Let's get back into the hand of power, victory, and glory. Devil doesn't like it, but I don't care. He katahi, he toloramaha. Oh, I feel something breaking up. We're breaking up and breaking through. Jesus. 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 Praise God. There is a spirit in our day. You may be seated for 20 seconds. There is a spirit in our day. It was prophesied in Daniel 7 that Satan would wear out the saints. There is a spirit of weariness. Maybe you don't have it in Texas. I've got it in Washington, D.C. A spirit of weariness. A spirit of pressure, life pressure 
There's an evil anointing, if you please, to suppress, to hinder, to wear out the saints, put heat on. There is only one remedy for that, and it ain't sitting there like a wart on a pickle. It ain't wondering what your neighbor's thinking. It isn't sitting there finding fault with somebody. The answer isn't wondering who's in the flesh and who's in the spirit. Nobody asked you to be the judge of that. There's only one answer. Get down on your knees and call upon the name of the Lord and then get up on your feet and begin to magnify him with all your heart until the breakthrough comes. I need a fresh anointing. David said, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. I feel some of that fresh oil in this room here today. My God, have mercy. We can't afford to let ourselves become raisins and prunes. Does that make any sense? I don't know if I make sense or not. It makes sense to me, you know. We can't afford to become has-beens and used-to-be's. If the devil wants to fight, who in here will rise to the occasion and give him one? Where are you that refuse to be put down, shoved into a corner, and will come out fighting and say, I refuse to be a coin lost in the house? Oh, yeah. It's hard to get stirred. It's hard to get stirred when you've already waved the white flag. It's hard to get stirred when you already said, I give up. But come on, somebody. Greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. Oh, my Lord. The yokes, the Bible says, are destroyed because of the anointing. He is trying to shackle us, bind us, put yokes on us. Isaiah 10, 27 says of New Testament salvation, there'll be a day, and we're in that day, when Satan's burden shall be taken off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. When I was baptized with the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the burden was taken off my shoulder. The yoke that was on my neck was destroyed. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. Free at last. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But I found out not many days after that Satan didn't go and die. He just regrouped. If he couldn't keep me out, he'll try to get me out. And if he can't get me out, he'll try to get me down. If he could get me down, oh, I feel like preaching about this. If he could get me down, he can neutralize me. That's exactly what he's trying to do in this day. If he can't get you out, He'll try to get you down to neutralize you so you can't have an effect. My Lord, I feel the glory of God in here. But the same anointing that broke the yoke the first time when he tries to yoke you again will break the yoke again. My Lord, have mercy. That's why I cannot sit there and watch somebody else get a blessing. I've got to get it for myself. Oh, my Lord. The only thing separating us from victory is a touch of the anointing of God. Because when you're anointed, you've got the victory. That anointing is the victory. That's why he wants us to sing dead, pray dead. 
be a blah church, be a blah Christian, because God doesn't anoint blah, but God anoints sincerity. God anoints truth. God anoints a praise that's sincere from the heart, and God inhabits the praises of Israel. And when the church begins to magnify the Lord, the anointing comes. Let's clap our hands and praise him again. Praise God. How many wants a breakthrough in your life? How many would like a breakthrough in your life? So when you go to that Sunday school class Sunday, instead of it being dry and dull, there's an anointing that flows out of your being, out of your spirit, and begins to touch those students all around you. You may be seated. My Lord. Shame those foolish virgins didn't get a breakthrough before it was too late. Shame Judas, he got his breakthrough, but it was too late. Ended up with a broke neck. The Bible says in Judah is God known. Judah is the praise tribe. Judah means praise. And judges, when it was time to go to battle, they said to God, who shall go up? He said, Judah shall go up. Because it's given into his hand. Judah went up, and victory was won. When praise goes up, victory is won. But isn't it interesting how that Judas is so similar to the name Judah? You look up Judas, you'll find one of the definitions is praise. He's a descendant of Judah. Every time Jesus called his name, he was calling him to do something that he would not do. He was so hung up on himself. We've got a lot of people that are so hung up on themselves. Getting hung up on yourself is a good way to wind up hung up. Judas was hung up on himself. You can't praise the Lord strutting. Well, I'm meddling now. Better get back in here. True worship lowers you down and lifts him up. You're not worshiping unless you're getting down a little bit. Come on, let's get down a little bit. Anybody feel like getting down? Now let me close with this thought. That not only did this lost coin represent this sheep, but in Bible days, and I'm sure you know this, when a bride would become a spouse or engaged to her future husband, he would give her what they called wedding coins. These wedding coins were a token of his trust in her. She would be given these coins in trust. And then she would weave them in her wedding garment veil. And at the time of their marriage ceremony, she would be brought to the bridegroom with these coins that had been placed in trust to her. They would be in her wedding garment and he would count the coins. Even the loss of one coin would be an indication of her untrustworthiness, her irresponsibility, and could in fact annul the contract and the covenant. They were given to her in trust, and she was to keep them significant of her trustworthiness. Anybody in here ever lose your checkbook or your wallet or a kid? A couple times I was tempted to lose my kid. Here, kid, wait here. I'll be back next year for you. 
You know that panic gets a hold of you? I lost my wallet the other day. Son, panic got a hold of me. When you lose your car keys or something of value, and that panic gets a hold of you, you don't care what you got to do to find what you lost. You'll open every drawer and throw underwear everywhere hoping you can find them car keys in there. You'll clean up the mess later. What you're looking for is that which was lost. And she got that kind of feeling about this coin. She tore the joint up. And since she recognized that the loss of even one of these coins could be enough, to cause the contract to be voided. Panic seized her soul. So she sought diligently. And she didn't quit. She knew it was in that house somewhere. And she sought diligently until she found it. I would like to submit to you that when you got saved, you were given some wedding coins, some gifts, some ability, some talent, some ministry, doctrine. And that God said, I want you to hold on to these coins. And when I come back, I'm going to count the coins. I'm going to see if you've been faithful. That's why he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm going to take an accounting. I'm going to count the coins. I'm going to see how well you've done. And I would say of this woman, sort of kind of shame on her for losing one of them, Brother Chance, but I give her an A plus for concern when she realized it was gone. I don't know how it slipped through her fingers, but I give her a big A plus for the right kind of attitude to get the coin back. She became quite radical about it. And she was so happy when she had found it. In the 20 years I've been in this, seems like I've observed, hope I'm not being out of line here today, but seems like I've observed some coins starting to be missing. How about, did God give you a coin of prayer and a prayer life? For some that used to pray, don't seem to pray like they used to pray. Hello? Used to be, seemed like to me, just, you know, being an observer around here, that you could go to general conference or other conferences and some people would get with it, people pray, people worship, all are still. It seems like people don't want to praise the Lord like they used to. How <sighs> many know what I'm talking about? Make sense? Coin lost. The good part, though, is they're still in the house. They can be found. Ooh. They may be lost, but they're not very far away. If somebody would care enough about it to light a candle, get in a prayer room. Seems like to me it wasn't as hard to get people to get in the prayer room before church, but now they want to fellowship on the pew. Wait for the band to strike up. How about through the 20 years I've been around, I've seen some people lose a coin of apostolic doctrine. I still love the message. Repent. I'll never forget hearing that message. I was in witchcraft. I was in seances. I had been in hypnosis trying to touch another world, and I wasn't satisfied. 
But when he walked into my room and he had a touch from that other world, he said, you need the Holy Ghost. You need to speak with other tongues. I'll never forget it. My heart leaped within me, and I said, this is what he was talking about. I love that new birth message, repent and be baptized, the first scripture ever me memorized. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Can I go back to Sunday school for a minute? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I don't want to lose that coin. I still think it matters if you believe in one God or not. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. I'm going to hold on to that coin. But not just that. I'm not going to only hold on to the doctrine, but I also want to hold on to the experience of prayer, fasting, worship. My Lord, have mercy. Those hands aren't so heavy on a Wednesday night, you can't lift them up. Those hands aren't so heavy on a Sunday night, you can't lift them up. Those feet aren't glued to the floor whereby you cannot chat a little bit into the joy of the Lord and stay in the hand. How about the coin of holiness and separation unto God? Don't you think it's still right to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord? I don't know. Has anybody lost that coin? It's in the house, so it didn't get out of the house. All we got to do is go back and find it. Does this make sense? I still think women ought to look like women and men ought to look like men. <laughs> Lord have mercy, Jesus. Hey, Brother Height, where are you? How about, man, this cat's got a hold of the coin of soul winning. But there's a lot of folks that have lost that coin. They don't witness anymore. They don't want to teach Bible studies anymore. Oh, when they first were in the hand, or when they first got the coin, they witnessed to everybody. They'll show up on Saturday visitation. I've got to close, but you get the point. How about the coin? Of brotherly love. You know what? This old time religion still makes me love everybody. Red or yellow, black or white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the little children of the world, even your brother that you don't agree with. Makes you love. Said it makes you love, but that's a coin seems like slipping out of people's hands. Praise God. Well, what was the remedy? Lighting a candle. Getting a broom. Boy, got to find this coin. I wonder, because my time is gone, let me ask this question. How many in the last, how many people out here in the last 10 minutes has God, and just let this be real, has God shown a coin that's maybe slipped out of your hand somewhere? Of you that just were honest enough to raise your hand, would you please stand up? My Lord, have mercy. Now, those of you that were honest enough, honest enough to raise your hand and sit up, would you lift both your hands to the Lord right now and just seek his face just for a minute? Is it all right if we pray, Brother Chance? 
I don't want to mess up the schedule. Would you praise him and seek him with a, with a, just let volume come out of a heart that's sincere right now. Oh, Lord, 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 these coins are in the house. They are within your reach. They're not very far from you. You know what? Let me talk to you for just a second. You know what the devil will tell you? You can't ever get that back. You're too far. It's too far gone. But I say to you, Jesus, if you saw where a coin had slipped out of your hand, that's because the Lord pointed it out to you. And he wouldn't point it out to you if he didn't have it right here in this house that you could get it if you wanted it. It's in the house. It's lost, but it's right in the house. As a matter of fact, they're all around the altar. These coins are all around the altar. But you're not going to get it being blase and complacent and satisfied. There's got to be that, that certain seizure of desire that got a hold of that woman when she got a hold of the candle. If there's a coin that you want, as I ask you in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to lift your hands one more time in just a minute. And when I say come, if you that raised your hand and you that stood still have a desire for that coin, I want you to make your way to this altar and begin sweeping, praying, and asking God to help you get the coin. Because he's going to count, ladies and gentlemen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, only nine. Let's lift our hands now one more time and praise God. And when I say come, please come. If you want that coin, come right now. Come right now, please. Find you a place to pray. Oh, I don't want to be in the house and lost in the house. Don't stop. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap, shall we? <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. If you have a knob that could do something with these monitors, I'd appreciate it. In other words, turn them up just a little, please, because they're not on at all. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Chance and Brother Jones, for inviting me. It's certainly my privilege to be here in Texas at this Sunday School Convention. I appreciate it very, very much. Thank you for your kindness toward me. And uh, to move right along with the shortness of the hour, let's get right to the Word of the Lord, found in the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. Amen. If you could do just a little bit more, it wouldn't hurt my feelings with it.